Here are four paintings. Three of them are painted by Van Gogh. Can you determine which one of these four is an imitation of Van Gogh? You can write your answer in the comments, and later compare it with the correct answer. If you guessed it right, congratulations, you are a great connoisseur of Van Gogh. If I manage to mislead you, well, then I've achieved something in studying Van Gogh's style. I'll try to share the knowledge I've gained with you, join the exploration. Alright, today's video will be dedicated to studying the master's technique. To do this, we will explore together what techniques Van Gogh used, what paints he used, how he applied his brush strokes. To understand all this, we will make a copy of his famous Starry Night. Additionally, we'll find out which stars and planets Van Gogh saw that night. In the second part of the video, based on the experience and knowledge gained, we will try to paint a new picture, imitating Van Gogh's style. It's an ambitious task, but an interesting one. Alright, let's go. I'll start working, broadcasting a time lapse of the process and simultaneously explaining all the nuances. Let's begin, perhaps, with the paints. From Van Gogh's letters to his brother Theo, we know which pigments the artist used. For its starry night, in addition to the obligatory zinc whites and ivory black, we will need Cadmium lemon Cadmium yellow, yellow ochre, emerald green, cobalt blue, ultramarine, Prussian blue, raw sienna, burnt umber A little more cadmium red or red ochre for accents, and for starry night, these paints will be sufficient. We can measure quite accurately the size and shape of the brushes used by Van Gogh from the strokes left behind, square section, approximately 6 mm in size. Therefore, for a canvas of 50 by 40, the optimal brush size would be around 3 mm. The drawing on the canvas can be transferred using the grid method, dividing the canvas and the original picture into equal parts and redrawing the contours of key elements with a simple pencil. We also need to learn how to reproduce Van Gogh's brush strokes. The artist used a quite expressive style of painting, working extremely quickly, vigorously, and applying paint with very thick strokes. To achieve a similar effect, First of all, it's necessary to set aside diluents, oil and paint thinner. Otherwise, the strokes will turn out thin, transparent, and without texture. In this case, it's not suitable. Van Gogh squeezed out a lot of paint onto the palette at once and heavily loaded the brush with it, so that a lump of paint formed at the end of it, which he applied with quick broken strokes. It seems that he held the palette close to the canvas with one hand, and with the other hand. He rapidly transferred lumps of paint directly onto the canvas, without stopping to clean the brushes and sometimes mixing the paints directly on the canvas. Practice applying such strokes. I deliberately used contrasting colors to show how interesting the paints mix when applying a stroke to the canvas. In the same way, dark blue and whites are mixed, creating a characteristic stroke pattern. Before starting work, carefully study the original. This will help understand how to apply paints correctly, how to compose strokes, how to create contrasting spots. In the description under the video, I will leave links to the original work, as well as a detailed list of materials used. If you look closely at the original, you'll notice that this painting is done on an unprimed canvas. From Van Gogh's letter to his brother, the local paint dealer primed canvases for me himself, but he is so lazy that I decided to order everything directly from Paris or Marseille and refuse his services, my patience ran out, while he was priming canvases for me in the size of 30, I managed to paint two pictures on unprimed canvas. Since canvases are sold already primed with white paint, for greater accuracy, I tinted the canvas with white lead and ochre. Then, when the paint dried, I used a little burnt umber, rubbing it with a regular dishwashing sponge. This is necessary to give the canvas the resemblance to an unprimed one. However, you can paint directly on white. The darkest blue is Prussian blue. A slightly lighter blue is cobalt, so beloved by the Impressionists. Cobalt, divine color, for creating space around objects, wrote Van Gogh. Mixing cobalt with whites gives even lighter shades. You may also notice greenish strokes, they are obtained by adding lemon cadmium to cobalt with whites. Cerulean blue and ultramarine can also be additionally used, which will allow you to experiment with shades of blue. The stars and the moon are yellow cadmium paints mixed with whites and sometimes with the addition of cobalt. The cypresses mainly consist of three pigments, emerald green, burnt umber, and ivory black. Emerald green at that time was extremely toxic both in color and composition. It was made based on arsenic. Fortunately, today's paints are non-toxic, although it's better not to taste them. 
During work, try to relax. Don't be afraid to make mistakes and apply the wrong shade. Firstly, you can always remove the paint from the canvas, and secondly, you can apply a more accurate shade on top, which will only benefit the texture of the painting. Unlike delicate and gentle watercolor, oil painting forgives mistakes and allows experimenting widely with tone, color, and texture. Try it, perhaps you will discover something new. Well, we've more or less figured out that starry night, we can hang the picture on the wall. Let's now move on to some fascinating scientific research. As an astrophysicist by education, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to find out which stars Van Gogh captured that night. We will use the Stellarium program and try to determine the exact date, time, and view of the night sky. In the program settings, we set the longitude and latitude of the town of St. Remy, as well as the approximate, for now, date, June 1889. The moon appeared as a crescent, just like in the painting, only from June 21st to 23rd. Then we look at what time the crescent moon will be low above the horizon. At approximately that time, the constellations of Perseus and to the right of it, Aries, were visible in the east. It seems that these two stars are either the pair Algol and Gorgonia Tertia of the Perseus constellation or Sheraton and Mesartheme of the Aries constellation. I think it's more likely the first pair, because the stars of Perseus are much brighter than the pair of Aries. Curiously, what is this extremely bright star? It's strange, there are no bright stars in this area. It could only be a planet, Venus or Jupiter. Let's look for where the planets were on that night. Jupiter was in the southwest that night, which is on the other side. But Venus, bingo. It rises in the east just after the moon, and on June 23rd, it is exactly at the same angular distance as in the painting. Thus, it confirms that Van Gogh saw this view on June 23rd, in the early morning, around 4 o'clock. Most likely, in the evening, he depicted the bright stars from the constellation of Perseus, and later, when the moon rose and behind it, the bright Venus, he added these objects. You probably already guessed that the correct answer to the question from the beginning of the video is B. Well, after thorough training, you can try your hand at creating a completely new canvas in the style of Van Gogh. Some characteristic principles of his later paintings are already known to us, pure bright colors, bold contrasting strokes, expressive and rapid manner of applying brush strokes. Let's try to depict a Provencal landscape with a wheat field, an olive grove, and a whimsical tree in the foreground. We'll use the same palette, naturally taking into account that it's daytime in our painting. To the yellow paints, I added Neapolitan yellow, and to the blues, cerulean. In this video, I continue my new series, Learning from the Old Masters, in which we have already explored the work and techniques of Johannes Vermeer and delved into the incredible imagination of Hieronymus Bosch in his famous painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights. Just like in this video, I tried to reproduce the style of the master by creating a new painting from scratch. If you enjoy this format, where I study the techniques of the old masters and try to paint a picture in the same style, please let me know in the comments which other artists and painting styles you are interested in. And don't forget to subscribe. The channel is new, so I welcome constructive criticism and feedback. If you find any inaccuracies or discrepancies with the generally accepted theory, if you have your own point of view, comments, or suggestions, write in the comments. The goal of the channel is to study different forms and styles of painting, and no one is immune to mistakes. Vincent van Gogh himself was tormented by doubts until the end of his life. His innovative style and unconventional painting techniques were often harshly criticized, which, of course, dealt blow after blow to the fragile ego and already weak mental health of the artist. In his letters to his brother Theo, he wrote, What am I in the eyes of most people? A zero, a weirdo, an unpleasant person, someone who has no position in society and never will have one, in short, a nobody. I want to show with my work what lies in the heart of this weirdo, this nobody. I want to make drawings that would excite and touch people. Henry Miller writes about him in his novel Plexus. His works are considered provocative. There is too much paint in them. What a cruel irony that this wonderful discovery, the ultimate saturation of the canvas with color, pure blazing color, the dream of all genius painters, finally realized, turns out to be used against them. You may ask, why copy the old masters? What is the point of repeating the past? Apart from developing skills in composition, style, and technique, it allows us to touch the great works of art and feel a connection with the artists of the past. 
Copying can also be a way of expressing respect for their talent and contribution to art. It is important to understand that copying should not be blind imitation. We must try to understand the artist's intention and interpret it in our own way. Thus, this approach can awaken our own creativity and give impetus to new ideas. Millet studied with De La Roche, Van Gogh copied Jean Millet, and now artists and filmmakers learn from Van Gogh. In Vincent's last letter to his brother, he wrote, I paid for my work with my life, and it cost me half of my sanity. It is difficult to add anything to this, but I would add one more phrase written by Vincent Van Gogh, which is perfect for the epilogue. One must love. Love as much as possible. For in love lies the true strength. And he who loves much does much and is capable of much. And what is done with love is done well. Thousands of people rush to museums and art galleries, crashing down like a Niagara Falls on the mesmerizing masterpieces of the unknown and rejected genius named Vincent Van Gogh. Van Gogh is finally with us. The great loser comes into his own, his sacrifice was not in vain. For he has not only become the property of the masses, but also influences contemporary artists, and this is more important.